it was, you know, it was probably the most important shift in my career because, not because of it started the notoriety that I got on the internet, it's because YouTube selling to Google for $1.7 billion, you know, I, there wasn't a single video on YouTube that had a million views when I was on. There was no videos that were 20 minutes long. Uh, YouTube literally flew me out to like explain why I was making videos over 10 minutes long. Um, and when it sold, no question, that singular day was the day that I realized, huh, I have some skill. You know, it, what it made me do was look back and say, you know, launching an e-commerce website in 1996 was probably pretty progressive after all. Doing email marketing when nobody was doing it was probably right. And buying those Google AdWords the day Google AdWords came out, that was probably smarter than I thought. It was no question the tipping point where I was like, hey, I have something else going on here other than I'm a good wine merchant. This is more macro. And obviously reading the articles of that Google sale purchase, it, there, there were a couple that referenced, and it was the first time I'd ever seen it, this term angel investor. Because I think a lot of people, they don't know, you know, I think people kind of, the people that know my story, they don't realize how insular I was. I, was. I wasn't in Silicon Valley, I was in New Jersey, I was in a cocoon of the wine business, I was super undereducated, so I didn't even really understand the world, to be very frank. Like I didn't, I, you know, for example, even a year later when I invested in Facebook, had I known of even the most basic concept of carrying people's money and making a 20% on the back end, I would have, I don't even want to know what I, would have happened because I basically bet my life that Facebook was gonna win and to just think about even getting $5 million of the liquor industry's rich guys and gals money and having another million on the back end, I mean it, it would have, you know, just to give you context, that, that would have translated into $180 million. I mean it was, it was, it's really fun for me to think about the brilliance of the things that I think I've done and the insanity and basicness. And I think that there's a level of, and I'm still that guy right now, uh, there's a deep commitment and obsession to the end consumer and almost nothing else. And what that means is I've gotta go through my own patterns to get educated. Uh, and so, yeah, I, was a, I, was, I saw YouTube, it was three months old. Nothing was going on. There was maybe some random article on like slash dot, yeah. you know, about it back in the day, nerd stuff. And I was like, this is this is it. This thing is it. And then right behind that, I decided I would be an angel investor. And if I felt that feeling of why I did ecom, email, Google AdWords, and YouTube, if I had that feeling, really I would compare it. Like the only comp that I've seen that I've consumed is the way Clive Davis in his documentary talked about you know, Mariah Carey or Celine Dion. I genuinely believe I trade on intuition and ear and understanding of what you're gonna do before you do it, the way I'm gonna trade voice going forward for the next decade. Um, and that's, that's how it happened. And so I started the wine show and uh, it changed the course of my career. It was a uh, dimly lit room. Yep. I recently went back and watched episode one. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. Just for its pure authenticity and rawness of what it's like to get started in pioneering something new and then to come to see you do a thousand of those shows later. Yeah. Which is a level of commitment. Yeah, I mean, jumping to number three, I mean, it's staggering to me that people don't understand the variable that hard work is. I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's stunningly funny to me that people don't want to acknowledge it. People love to talk about working smart. People love it. Uh, and that's fine, and I think that's exactly right. But you don't know a single person that has ever become successful without putting in an obnoxious amount of work. It doesn't exist. You know people that have wealth that were handed it, but you know nobody who's earned it without putting in the work. And, and I think, you know, and the reason I like it so much, even at the face of pushback in today's very live your life, work life balance environment, and I love it, I love it. I'm thrilled for that. You need to be self aware. Um, I love it because it feels the most controllable. It feels a hell of a lot more exciting to me give advice and say, if you're not happy, work three more hours a day than it is go get smarter. What, what year was it that you launched that first show? 
February 21st, 2006. Watching what's happening with entrepreneurship right now is very exciting and concerning all at the same time. Um, you know, I'm 42 years old. I was an immigrant from the Soviet Union. Education was the way out. And I was a DNF student. And so basically what that meant if you grew up in the 80s and early 90s was every parent and teacher thought I was gonna be a loser. Because it was a binary game of if you don't go to a great school, you can't win in life. It was just, you know, for everybody over 40 in here, you understand that. It was binary. There was no conversation of entrepreneur. I mean, the first time, I, you know, entrepreneur is an extremely new term. Like, even I called myself a businessman, not an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur meant you were a loser. Like, like you had a, like a card that said you were an entrepreneur and meant that you like lived on a beach and had an idea. Like, it was so terrible. Uh, and now everybody's trying to be one. And I think we're overcorrecting in the same way that entrepreneurs tried to be good students and that was a bad idea. You've got a lot of people that should work at BlackRock and are actually trying to be entrepreneurs and they will fail because they're incredible number threes, seven, nines, twenty sevens. Being a number one is a totally different DNA trait. It means you love getting punched in the mouth. It means you don't care about what other people think. It, it means so many things that we don't talk about and I think a lot of people will go into very bad mental places in their mid, first of all, if you look at the current state of a 22 year old entrepreneur, the scariest part is if they are overeducated, um, they're going in a system that they've never had any real adversity. The game is so big. If you come from the right family, you feel no feelings of pushback and then you go into the wild and you've got a business and the market, the market doesn't give a fuck about your grandfather. And, and I'm watching it every day and it's not fun. It's not fun for a 24 year old, 11 months in realizing that they're soft and not as smart as they thought they were and their idea of building the Uber for laundry mats is a bad idea. I've been chasing attention my whole life. This isn't new, this isn't email and Google. This is, I used to do that, I would literally try to figure out physically with your eyes as a driver like if you were looking at that tree or that tree or that post and, and then I thought, oh my God, that's what I did at baseball card shows at 11, that's why I didn't set up my table for the first four hours while everybody else did and would walk the floor and watch what people were reacting to so that I would go back and set up my table. Oh shit, that's why I dominated in my dad's liquor store because when I was 14 and stood behind the register, I would watch people walk into the store and like how they would navigate. Oh shit, that's why my websites did so well because I was doing UI and UX before I realized what UI and UX was and it all came back and probably in the last four or five years I finally articulated it which is like, fuck, it's all empathy. This is all empathy. I'm a good leader, I have a good community, I'm a great with consumers because I deploy empathy at scale. It is always about them, never about me. You, wanna, you want me to save you a lot of time, BlackRock? You know why you can't get people interested in wealth? Because it's about you, not them. You're trying to figure out how to make it valuable for you to get them interested in it, in what's in it for you. The end. You haven't reverse engineered what they give a shit about. And then all those people in that video, that's cute in front of a camera, but that's not the truth of how they're gonna navigate their lives actually. Okay, so, um, flowers. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to baseball cards, to a slight tangent. Um, to see black rock videos, eventually to wine, and then to, to, to I mean, and, and I love this evolution from, from a Gary Vaynerchuk to, to Vayner to just a Gary V. Right? Yeah. Um, just, like, where'd you get your hustle? I think work, at, you know, I'm, again, I'm not a great student, but it, it seems to me, at least in the ethos, that a lot of people agree that work ethic is taught, and so that's very easy. My parents, I mean, <laughs> it's such a big deal. Like, it's such a big deal. Um, my I mean, I didn't even see my dad. My dad and I slept in the same roof every day of my life for the first 18 years of my life. Every day. We just didn't, we took one family vacation. My dad never traveled once. Um, and I never saw him until I was 14 years old. He left before I woke up. He got home after I fell asleep and he was a merchant, right? 
He left at seven, he got home at 11 p.m. That was his life and he worked every day. My parents are from the Soviet Union so even though they grew up in the 80s and 90s, which is still more common than today, but they lived that classic 1947 separate life, right? Like completely, se- like two separate entities. Uh, my mom raised the three of us. We never had, there was, you know, my mom did everything. Like I don't even know how to do laundry Like to this day. Like she did absolutely everything. She worked from, the moment she woke up to the end of night, and so like my parents She's still doing the laundry. <laughs> I wish, uh, no, but you know, I think I think I think work ethic is ve- my hustle comes from my parents. Gotcha. It's very clear. They, I mean, you know, it's funny. Me, my mom, and dad. When it's just the three of us, not my sister and brother, which happens rarely, but so, if we are somewhere within the first hour, we'll start making fun of each other in such a loving way, which is like fuck. We're just a bunch of working dogs. You know, like we just work. Like, you know, and then I'm competitive, and and with my dad and him with me, and so he worked so much. So that I think, you know, I have the luxury of the internet and travel to outwork my dad, right? Like, which has been like a really funny thing with me and him in the last five years. Which is like him conceding that I work harder. It's probably the most devastating thing that's ever happened to him, <laughs> and easily the most gratifying thing that's ever happened to me. So. Um, my parents. Okay. Um, so I think by now we have a good picture of, of who is, is, is Gary V. Let's, let's pivot to, to present day, right? Um, you got loads of books. Yep. Hard copy books. Yeah. You're also an online social media guru. I'd love to know your view on like what's the, what's, where do you see the, the purpose of print today in, in book form? Um, and then just a couple of the key themes that you think are most important from your, your, your series of books that you've produced. I think that, uh, and this could be a good takeaway as I was thinking about your business and I think about you know, financial services as a whole uh, and just everything to be very frank. My, what, I, what do I see in books? I think it's a lack of friction to somebody who wants to read a book. Meaning my information needs to be empathetic to the way people consume. So if there's enough people that want to read a book in hard copy, I don't have an ideological point of view on technology or how one should consume. I could give a fuck if you want to listen to it on Kindle or audiobook or read a hard copy or, you know, to me, the greatest job for all of us is to create no friction to the way that somebody wants it. And so the place of a book in 2018 is a lot of people read books. And so I don't have a problem con- you know, producing my content in that form. Gotcha. Um, key themes from those books. I think the key themes are self-awareness, patience, uh, lack of ideological point of view on what's happening How here. How do you teach self-awareness? I have no idea. Don't know. I, think I, I think my little part in it is I want to bring awareness to it, strength. And then and maybe that means something. I sure know that it wasn't alpha male to talk about empathy and gratitude and self-awareness. And so if there's a bunch of people who think I'm cool that are 17 year olds that now think that's cool and put more effort into that, that would be good over putting cash to your ear or champagne bottles or going, like jumping over the fence at a private plane place to take a photo like you're going on a private plane for your Instagram or all the other horse shit that people think is cool. Um, I don't know how you teach it, but I definitely know it needs to be talked about. Okay. Um, There's actually an over or under on Gary dropping F-bombs today for the (laughs) track or F-tree right now. I'm not gonna tell you what the over or under is. Um, so let, let's talk, let, let's move You away. clearly have the over because bringing awareness to it, you want me to feed it. Um, <laughs> good call, good call. I too am competitive. Um, all right, so uh, uh, less about uh, things that you've done, more about what you see uh, okay. out in, in the space, uh, whatever industry it is that you think are the next successful products to come on, right? You've had a good nose sniffing out some stuff in the past, like what do you think is next? I have not invested for a little while now in early stage because I think the supply and demand mm-hmm. curve of entrepreneurs got broken and now I'm guessing versus betting on proper opportunities. I am absolutely gonna jump back in when the apps that are built on top of Google Home and Amazon Alexa happen. I believe the next Spotify, Snapchat, Instagram, Waze, uh, Venmo, Wish will be built on top of Alexa and Google. 
I think everybody here will overly engage with apps built on top of voice devices and I view the Alexa and the Google Home and the Apple Pod the same way I view the iPhone and the Android device. I think the stakes are gonna be very high in voice. I think a lot of people are gonna be uh, crushed uh, including things that, like I'm fascinated that I think Google search in a visual form is in deep shit. Which is wild, right? Because that will, this is what's so fun about getting older, you get to see things go the whole loop. To, for me to be able to live through Google search destroying things and then becoming the yellow pages itself because of voice is going to be an unbelievable thing to watch from beginning to end. But that is happening. I promise all of you in the next 12 to 15 years you'll be stunned by how much your search is done based on you just talking in your room not by you grabbing your phone and doing it because it's just faster. The reason you all text now is it was faster than a phone call. Voice will be faster than texting. Thus, you will always choose speed. You will always choose, you will choose speed over everything. When I started, you know, I was early in Uber, when I started seeing who was taking Ubers, AKA back to wealth, people that couldn't afford it, it wasn't me judging people's, you know, the, the great thing that this room will struggle with on the BlackRock and financial side is people want to be, people want, you want them to be financially fit and smarter about wealth without understanding what people actually value. People talk because of social pressure around valuing money, most actually don't. So let's, you want to really, you want to break through insight? That's one. Because if you actually accept that truth, you will start navigating in a very different way because it's not about your self-interest and your ideology, it's about the reality of the consumer and then you can start creating services around that. Carrie, how do, how, uh, let's, let's peel that onion a little bit. How do you define wealth? The ability to do anything I want at all times. That, you know, so for me, that doesn't take that much money. That takes, you have to understand how to run your own personal P&L. I know plenty of people who make $9 million a year who have golden handcuffs, right? Because they've created too much costs to maintain their lifestyle. So for me, I got lucky because I'm addicted to the game, not to the trophy. And I understood that after I dropped the Yankees and the Rangers after they won their championships, mm-hmm. but I'm still feverish about the Jets and the Knicks. I'm in it for the chase. Which is, geez, if you can get into that, you're set. Because it really changes it. But that, that's how I define it. I define it as the power to be able to do whatever I want. People are like, you're so transparent. You're so authentic. I'm like, sure, because I'm not worried about the ramifications of anything I say. Well, I mean, if you weren't scared of anything, you would tell the truth all the time too. You know? Is your, um, is your end game still to buy the New York Jets? Absolutely. I really think I can, I want to, but most of all it's fun to try, right? Okay. Like I love that I sold a significant piece of VaynerMedia which everybody here, my financial advisors would have told me it was stupid and they would have been right. I sold it when it was doing 14 million, it's gonna do 140 million this year and I knew that was gonna happen. I did it because I sold a piece to Stephen Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins and over the last six years I've integrated myself into the NFL family in a way that's going to matter because guess what? It's an old boys club and in 22 years when I have the wealth to get in, they're gonna have to say yes. And they say no a lot. So you have to know what you're playing for. Gotcha. Um, What if you were playing for the Premier League? Which team would you buy? (laughs) What would be the end game there? So, you know, we were talking about this and if people really are following me on social, I'm very much trying to figure out my team because I, I realize, you know, right now I'm coming here every three months. This will be music to Eric's ear. I'm starting to realize this is gonna end up being an every six week thing. And you know, I'm a die hard fan. I will tell you the one thing I envy tremendously. So here's what I don't love about the Premier League. It's about money. Like, uh, the same reason I don't like baseball is I don't like that people buy championships here. And that in itself eliminates a lot of the merit and excitement. And I'm aware that once in a blue moon, a team will come along and do what happened a couple years ago. But for the most part, this is a money game. And so I hate that. Um, but what I do love is that you actually give a fuck about your teams here. Like in a way that is super different than what is going on in the US. Like there isn't diehard fans. It's, you know, this is, it's real religion here, so it's awesome. So I wanna pick a team. Totten is like on the top of my list. The Spurs have my attention because they haven't won in so long. Any fans in the room? Tottenham? Oh, yeah. So Tottenham is super 
at the top because of the lack of a championship in the last 40 years. But I'm really thinking about going for the ultimate climb, which is what if I go to the third division and see it all the way through? So that's kind of where my head's at right now. Okay. To me, if you are not relevant as a human or a business or a, a organization on Facebook and Google and Instagram and LinkedIn and YouTube, you actually don't exist. And so I think it's the current state of the internet, the way I think voice will be the next current state of the internet until we potentially move to blockchain, which will then change this whole game. Um, so I, th- I mean, it, you know, it's insane to me that if you told me, hey Gary, do you wanna be on a top 10 podcast or do you want a video to show up on the number one Instagram account or do you wanna be on the front page of the New York Times, it's like a laughable choice of the two. And so I think it's the current state of attention. I think it has all the leverage. I think it, I find it funny that people in business think Facebook is a nuance or can't change their business yet the CEO has to sit in front of Congress because the American institution think it's, it's powerful enough to overthrow the fucking government. Uh, you know, I, I, I laugh when I'm here. I mean, why do you think, where do you think Brexit comes from? Like, the, where do you think nationalism is being born from? This is it. This is the television and radio of our society. The internet has won. There is no debate. And, um, and everybody in this room is grossly underestimating its power. This. What we're doing right now physically is secondary. And the sooner you understand that, the more likely you'll be successful in whatever your ambitions are, whether to sell sneakers or to raise money for the PTA or become the mayor of your town. This right here, the physical shit, it's secondary. You may not like it. It doesn't matter what you think. This is where our lives are playing out and so I think I think underestimating the power of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and podcasting and just the content of the internet is at your own peril. Great. Um, perspectives on financial services as a sector. What's working, what's not working? What would you do differently? Um, things that are not working, on, in general, there's an audacity that I think is an enormous vulnerability. Uh, I think not unique to financial services. Anybody in the world that cares about the financial health of their business in an every 90 day window is completely fucked. And so my biggest concern for financial services is most of them play in a Wall Street environment and they do nothing but short term behavior which is defense in the face of the biggest change in our society. It is, it is laughable that Venmo was not created by a financial service. It is laughable uh, for financial services to be as naive as they are about blockchain and what that actually means. It's gonna eliminate all your margins. I mean, you know, look, what's, what's not working is not unique to financial services. Anybody that is in a lead position financially in the world today has their resources tied up in something that has lost its leverage. And so that's a problem. And and here's what I think is funny. Why are we so entitled to have the world at a standstill during our lives? Meaning, I want you to level up what I'm actually talking about which is why do we get to have peace and why do we have to get continuity financially or economically? Like why are we not supposed to be a generation that goes through a Great Depression. Why, 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 why? You know, like, you know, I just, in America, I always, I'm, like, I'm like, why can't we be the generation that watches our empire falling? I mean, anybody that doesn't understand that China's gonna win is just naive. This place used to be number one. And then America became number one. And the same reason this place lost its leadership is the same reason America's gonna lose its number one. It's called entitlement. It's called too much prosperity, which then creates a generation that doesn't know how to fight for it. And so that's more on a country basis. I think this is a macro thing, lifted above all that. And so, you know, look, I, I, you know, you make, you, when you are, my friends, when you, when you make money by being in the middle and the internet and blockchain come along and they're the actual middle, 
you're in trouble. So you need to figure out what the hell you're actually doing in providing value. And the fact that you amassed a moat that gave you an advantage to, and that became your middle, that's a bad business when that doesn't bring any value anymore. So let me tell you what I do think is working and I do think BlackRock has done this incredibly well and I'm sure for the most financially rigorous it has been something that the, you have looked down on because you don't understand what's actually happening which is I think what BlackRock has done well, let's speak about BlackRock specifically, is it's actually built a brand. And if you actually understand what's happening in technology, you will realize very quickly that brand is the only thing left. And so I think that it's given the organization permission to create other services if they actually understand. The problem is companies in financial service, like every other company, and Chase is a big client of ours in the US, and we do some work with RBS here. I mean, it's just, it's just so obvious. You can't hold on to things that are high margin when you already see the alternative in your face for the consumer and that's the vulnerability. What about other brands outside of BlackRock in the industry? I think everybody's doing the same thing, you know, to, including BlackRock. I, I think that there is a tone deaf nature to the way we communicate to consumers that comes from an ivory tower and is completely predicated on self-interest and then even worse, creatively, sits with five or six people who love the power of having their subjective point of view be the king or queen of the decision who then also are putting out very safe content and vanilla content which ends up meaning nothing to anybody and because they're scared to lose, do anything that would risk this cushy life they have to be the person that says the video's nice or not. Okay, let's open it up to the room. And I do see Mark Adams almost in the front row. He's probably bound to have a question. Not to put you on the spot, but I see other hands going up as well. So let's, let's just start right there on the left. Or, or straight to, to Mark. Hey, Gary, I'm laughing here because this is this fire as it was. <laughs> Thank you, man. Um, bro, like, oh, you, I love the way you talk about things that. Uh, you, you, I feel like you, you're very much into democratizing power. And like, I want to I kind of go there for a second. Like, we'll just talk about that for a second. Because you, know, you talk about that entitlement and like the fact that you were coming from the Soviet Union and the hustle and the, and I love that because it, it goes against, you know, we live in a class society here, you know, where certain things are about who your grandfather were and, you know, was and, and could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that? I, I you, know, really you know what's funny? It's not an ideology, it's a practicality. I'll be very honest with you, I have a funny feeling if I, was, if I was born 40 years ago, I would be excited about classism. I'm just real, like, I'm not excited about the democratization of everything, I just know it's happened. It's called the internet. Sorry. Like, it's over. Do you understand this has just started? Like, everything, if you're on defense to what's been happening, right, from a classism or I've put my, retail. If you have 8,000 leases, and, the, and it's not, everybody talks about retail is dead, TV is dead, and then everybody will counter with like, yeah, it's so dead that it's still doing 80% of the retail. They don't understand. When you go from doing 100% of the retail to 80% of the retail, when you run an actual P&L, all it needs to do is go to 79% for the whole thing to break because your leases then can't support, like your cogs break. When you can't get out of your lease, but your foot traffic goes down by 1%, you're out of business. I, I'm, I think because of the way I communicate and because of like my jerseyness and my immigrantness, I don't think people pay attention to what I'm talking. I think they downsize the complete and utter understanding I have for psychology and business. And I love that. I love, you know, I, will, I probably manifest and force being underestimated because it's an advantage. Ask me why I'm willing to be self-promotional but you know very little about VaynerMedia. It's because I'm smart. 
because I didn't want anybody to know anything about VaynerMedia because it's way more dangerous than the incumbents realize and the more I can make them think that I'm a charlatan, the more time I have to fucking destroy them. Uh, let's go to the next question. Gary. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, big fan. Thank you. Uh, I think you're probably one of the best content marketers out there just because you're so damn efficient. <laughs> Thanks. You got a podcast, which you use to create a book, which has a hashtag, as a name. Wonderful. Um, in Ask Gary V, hashtag Ask Gary V, you talk a lot about clouds and dirt. Yes. Um, I think clouds is thinking big, but I think dirt is the work, which you also talk a lot about, right? Um, and I'm, I'm really curious if you could just give me an example of what, what, what do you consider to be the work and what is the right work? How can people differentiate between just uh, monotony and doing the right work? That's a great question. I, you know, let me give you a clouds and dirt thing. I decide that voice is the next frontier. The dirt is, I do a podcast. We build an Alexa skill. I spend tons of time watching how people react to other Alexas. I fly to Seattle for two hours just to meet the Techstars Alexa team on my dime, which is rare these days, and fly back. You know, I'm putting, I I follow up my macro thesis with micro work to close the gaps because what I realized over the last 20 years is, you know how many people in here have opinions about things based on headline reading, not practitionership? I don't want that vulnerability. I don't like when I hang out with very smart people and then I realize they have no idea what they're talking about in the area that I understand. And I knew this about wine. Growing up in the wine business, I became deeply educated. And all of a sudden, I started meeting fancy three-star Michelin sommeliers and I realized, actually, he or she doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. They're using you know, their brand, their status, but their headline, and it's become so much bravado, I stay in my lane. There's a ton of stuff around wealth that I could never talk about at anywhere close to the level that the people in this room understand, right? So I stay in my lane. I, the right work is very subjective. For example, all my fancy friends think me community managing and replying to everybody on Instagram is the stupidest use of my two hours. I think it's the reason I'm the best consumer researcher in the world. Who's right, who's wrong, I don't know. It all plays out in the end. I think what we need to do is not judge ourselves overly in small pockets. I think people start dwelling when they look back and say, oh, the last three months I wasn't doing smart work. It's three months out of 100 years. So I think judgment on oneself is an important conversation around this. Otherwise you start dwelling on inefficient work. It's good to be thoughtful, but I think people get caught up in like, is this smart? Or, you know, I mentioned it earlier. I don't know, I'm a big fan of offense. I used this analogy last night. In proper football terms, I want my team to win nine to seven, which is an unusual score. When I talk about in the US, I talk about 157 to 142 in basketball. That's who I am. And I think that is a very good model because what you realize is that means you don't respect defense. And when you don't respect defense, it's actually another way to say, hey, everybody who's a CFO-centric company in the world, and let me save you time, that's all of them? Like CEO and CFO dynamics are funny. I was like, wait a minute. This is only the last three years for me. I'm like, wait a minute. CEOs don't run companies. CFOs run companies. I'm like, that's stupid. (laughs) So. I saw, uh, yep, more hands are going up. Yep, she's in the back. Um, Hi. hi. Um, What's your name? Uh, it's Jasmine. Jasmine. Um, I was curious about what you said earlier about how um, we're going to all move to Alexa, Siri, all of these type of technologies, and with the backlash that's happened in terms of privacy terms, where do you think the opportunities are? Because do you think this is just a blip where everyone suddenly thinks, oh, I don't want this thing listening on all of my private conversations, or are people en masse going to say, actually, I don't really care if companies own all of my private information. Number two. And so you think people won't care? I know people don't care. No, no, but do you think they will continue? Because I think especially in terms of younger demographics, people have more of an awareness about it. Do you think that's just going to be entirely overridden? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I, th- I think it goes, I, think it go- I, I, th- I actually think it goes way further than that. I actually think the greatest thing in the world would be for all of you to realize there's no privacy. No, no, I think people realize there's no privacy, hence people are becoming more aware. I mean, the whole, you know, Edward Snowden recently said that people are still vulnerable and people are still not in control, but at least they have the information now that they are not in control. He's super naive. Let's play it out. No, let's play it out. Let's play it out. out. We've been very aware. 
like, no, no, Snowden's been, I mean, I would argue, you would argue, and I think you'd agree with me, that over the last 24 to 36 months, this has become a much bigger thing. When do people most act? Most act when it first becomes aware. People most act when something first becomes aware, and we're not acting at all. Like, like if you look at, this is not my opinion, this is macro data. Everyone's like, unsubscribe from Facebook, really? Like, look, look at all the data. Like, really? Alexa's, like, with all the mainstream media that gets clicks for the propaganda that Alexa's listening to you, Alexa and Google Home are staggeringly growing. We don't, here, let me tell you why we will ultimately not care about privacy. Because the number one underrated thing in the universe is the human being. We need to get over our cynicism in a 100 year period, and we will, as things become more transparent. I'm completely bought in that, will there be blips, will there be places, sure, but like, I think people really don't understand human beings. I, I just really think people don't understand human beings. Why do human beings live in, in dictatorships? Why do like human beings live, like, like the judgment that we depose like, like on people that live in China or Venezuela or Belarus, like I think people are, are very naive. And so what I mean by that is there will always be something else. There's always things in play. This is giving us more power, not less. Can I ask you one follow-up question? Sure. And in terms of commercial terms, don't you think there's a commercial opportunity for someone to go and say, I'm going to help you protect your data because I'm 100% sure I don't want you. I of course I do. My data. You mean insurance? No, not insurance. No, I mean insurance. What I mean by that is, of course I think mm -hmm. that people can make a lot of money by selling fear. And yes, I think a lot of you will fall for it. But not the yet solution because I think I don't think it's illegitimate to say I don't want your corporation or Google or Apple to own my data. I just don't want that. So yeah. I would be happy to pay for someone to protect me from that. Yeah, Are I think. People like that? Uh, I I think that that will happen, and I think that it will be a small percentage, because I think subconsciously it sounds great on paper, but it's not the reality of how it works. For example. Let's play it for a second. Just for fun, Jasmine. What is so scary about Google owning your data? Let's just play for a second. Like, I, I, everybody got in such an uproar about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Like, talk to me. Like, what? Ads are more relevant to you? Like, like what have you guys been doing? What have credit card companies been doing? What have retail stores been doing? Like, like you know, I think that it's fear mongering of the current platforms and I'm just, I'm just really darn curious what Apple's gonna do to you with your data. Let's talk it out. Okay, so I think the difference is a corporation is not a democratically elected government. And if a corporation... <laughs> Sorry. No, no, yeah. fair enough. Like, I know no, no, but I mean, that's, I have to react that way because I think that's an important part and I think that's a... You, you're very smart. That's exactly where this needs to go. But keep going. So and if a company holds that much information on that many people, we, I mean, we know this, this is news, People can influence people en masse, as you said. You said well, Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather platforms with data, with the ability to get information in front of you, have the chance to influence you versus, you mean the way we had it, where four old white dudes influenced everybody? I'd like to think that not four old white dudes influenced me. Well, let me save you time. That's what it was. It was Rupert Murdoch and Red and all the people. I didn't read Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, but. but no, no, stop, 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 Jasmine. You don't consume their media, that means you would also not consume the Facebook content that you think that they have the power. We've ha always had choice and we do. There's a laughable conversation that if you chose not to read something or watch a certain channel, that miraculously they would penetrate you on Facebook. That's just not how it works. Like, I, I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a suggestion. The two of you should specify <laughs> <laughs> perhaps over some tea or maybe a bite of beer later. Um, but I see so many other hands going up with questions, especially no in the worries. Room here. I just want to get, get to some more people. I, get a I will introduce. Will you no. but yeah. okay. I'm, um, I'm just interested in that conversation. It's, it's about control because. The four white dudes, they might have some influence the way you think, but the internet Not some. is way bigger. You're wrong. No? Let's play it out. Okay. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's play it out. There's, let's play it out. The, you know, I think there's a naivete of supply and demand. The supply of the four white dudes 
filled all the buckets. The supply of the internet is endless. The reason we have more radical points of view is the endlessness. But I think there's something that Jasmine and I over tea would get to in the same place and I think we believe in a lot of the same things. I think what would end up happening after our lovely tea is that (laughs) the question that most matters is where do we hold ourselves accountable? Let me just save you time. Whether it's the four old white dudes or the new platforms, we need to start looking at ourselves for accountability. We choose, we choose and there's an incredible interest to how we're being manipulated. We've always been manipulated, we're always gonna continue to be manipulated or we're not depending on how you're wired. So I think you know, there's a lot to that but I, I, don't, I don't think they're smaller or, or the internet's vaster. There's more information which means there's more fragmentation. We more thought alike. Now, you were very fine to say, you know what, I liked when four people controlled it because we were all more here and that might be a very valid argument. It's probably similar to my argument about why I think China will win. It's more like a business. There's some things that are you know, dictatorship, there's some things that are more capitalistic. But I don't, I don't think, you know, that, I think that's the way we have to think about it. Like they, they had 100% penetration between two points of view. It's why we were all closer. The reason we're expanding, but I think we have to hold ourselves accountable. You have to say Facebook and Google run on your attention. If they feed you things that you don't want, if you're a conservative and you're getting nothing but liberal stuff, outside of the fact that you want to engage with it, or if you like football but you're getting basketball, the only asset that Facebook has is your attention. Thus, they want to give you what you want. What I think we're struggling with is very simple. I think people think technology is changing us. I think it's exposing us. I think we don't want to be held accountable. I think we don't like who we actually are. What do you think? Uh, what do you, what, I, want to, I, want to, I want to give her some time, I think that's fair. What well, do you think? Okay, so I just wanted to say that um, I think that we all should be accountable to ourselves and um, some of us probably are, you are to yourself, but um, are a lot of people and, and so that's where I'm concerned and I kind of think of um, Star Wars and all the guys in white suits, you know, they all just march the line because that's the way it's going and, and is that the way it's going and and when you say things like oh the you know bricks that were they were clones by the internet by the way the stormtroopers <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, so yeah, they guys. should be marching yeah. in the same direction um, <laughs> by design <laughs> but you know um oh the bricks of vote oh that was controlled by the internet well did uh, it wasn't controlled by inter- actually, yeah go ahead. people really voted for brexit or they didn't they were influence to vote and did they have control over how they voted? So that's... Well, let's talk, there's so many things that you have, but here's the thing, I think we try to talk about these things in not, in one term, not the overall thing. Like, how many people voted for Brexit? You know, where does that sit on accountability? Like, there's so many variables in play here and once again, I think that we are looking at the current state of media consumption and content and we're not having it in a alternative. The reason I bring up the alternatives is those are the alternatives. And then I think there's no difference between clicking the channel, buying the newspaper that you decide to buy, or the stuff that's coming in your feed. I think the reason people think there is is because I think they lack the education on what's actually happening in those feeds and why. I, I believe that. Gentleman in the blue shirt, front row here. And then we're gonna go into the back of the room too. I keep seeing the hand. Hey, uh, my name's John. Um, I was looking for a bit of advice for any of the entrepreneurs in the room. It sounds like you're doing podcast books, multiple investments, managing a services business, etc., etc. How do you deal with the context switching between all of these different things? Is there sort of an approach you take or a method that you use to sort of stay focused and be able to jump between all these different and the two hours that you spend with consumers every day? How do you keep going through that? How do you manage that context switching? I, I, I navigate it very simply, which is I scratch the itch that needs it at the moment. I, I think there's too much upfront planning and then we get paralyzed by over planning it. How do I handle it? I don't think about it. I know what my responsibilities are. I have plates in the air and I don't know, this plate feels like it's starting to not spin as well. And so I'll spin it and then, and then I try to, in parallel, try to pay attention to the plates. I'm like, do I even want that plate? So you try to be thoughtful while executing, macro, micro, clouds and dirt, 
And, and I think ultimately, John, I think the biggest thing that works for me is not over judging it. Like I'm not devastated if that plate falls because guess what, I have 41 plates and like the net of 40, it's back to this net game of 157, it's 9-7. One could argue like your defense is rubbish. I'm like, cool, I won. <laughs> Got it? Cool. The question in the back of the room. You know, I think it depends on, why don't you hold the mic? Let, let's play it, first of all, there's so many things going on here and I love this, I mean I would, I would sit here for 15 hours and talk with you guys about this because it's super interesting, right? Like it's our lives. Meaning, first we have to start with what information? Like I'll answer that but I just wanna like, we're all here, we're clearly got momentum in this conversation. Like what information? That you like root beer? That, you're, that, you, that this is where you shop? This is how much you spend? Your social security number? Like where are we going here? I, I, again, I think that we're reading headlines. We need to have this conversation. What information? Google has more than Facebook. Financial services have more. I'm way more scared that Chase has my social security number. Facebook doesn't. Like, so that's number one. Number two, I would recommend them being accountable. Let me tell you what I, let me tell you the scariest year of my life in like this topic. From October 2001 to October 2002, I went to Al Jazeera's website a lot. And even back then I was like, hmm, I have a funny feeling the FBI knows I'm doing this, right? Even back then. Um, You know, I don't know. Like again, let's talk this out, false information. So okay, you read an article in Facebook, which by the way, you can read in the sun as well, with like this notion that human journalists that work in these companies are the true, like this is a very important conversation. So anyway, back to your question, what? About a policy, about a person that's running for office, about the information about the environment? I don't know, what should you do? You should do what all thoughtful people do, which is you should be open to a lot of pieces of information versus what actually is happening in this wave of emotion, which is maybe you're just actually reading something you want to be reading and it's reinforcing what you want to believe and that is what we need to unpack. You know, I don't know. I mean, like, I, you know, there's an important thing here. This notion that these that these Russians are getting in and giving you an article about this point of view, it's just it's a very interesting headline. And and I and I love I love even talking about this because I love trying to map what people are thinking. I love when people tell me I'm naive, right? I really love that. Because I would argue we have to have a conversation about the human spirit. And I want, you know, listen, I want people to understand how this actually works. The last 70 years that were built on more closed media produced the Nazis, produced all these things. They produced them, my friends. You have to understand how it actually works, right? I was born in the Soviet Union. My mom wrote a book report pre-internet My mom wrote a book report that Fidel Castro was the bravest man in the world. That he was in the face of this awful place called America in this small little island was one man who is so brave and so special and his name's Fidel Castro and he's the best. Is that right? Is that wrong? This is a more complicated, what do I think people should do? I think they should be thoughtful and educate themselves from different points of view. After 9-11, I went on Al Jazeera every day because I wanted to hear what they had to say because I was curious on the point of view. You know, why is Russia gaining momentum? Because they're using the internet, but also Russia won the network channel that people are thrilled to put on their cable service providers because they get a fucking vig on the $3 per subscription, but it's also allowing people to hear a different point of view, like different points of view. They come in all media forms, not just the internet, comes in print and radio and television. It's always been the same. Here's one difference. There's scale on the internet, which is why you'll get extreme points of view, you'll get fragmented points of view, and we're gonna have to go through this. Gary, I wanna see if there's any other questions on this side of the room, because I think we kind of favored. Let's, let's, do, let's do one more question, and we're gonna move into a wrap-up mode here. Um, quick question, you, you talked about blockchain and the fact uh, financial services need to give it more focus. What, what do you think is the next vertical, next industry that's gonna be really disrupted by blockchain? I'm not sure. I, I even think blockchain itself is still murky for me, but w- here's what I know. That 
a lot of people aren't educated enough about blockchain and understand like new blockchains will be built. Ultimately, here's what I know. When, when you get into a place of peer to peer, I'm a big believer that what's actually happening here with technology is it's making us go all the way back. Because that's how life works with technology, right? Like look what voice is gonna do. It's gonna make us go back to like a radio environment that we thought we left in the 40s. It's really fun to watch. Like all this podcast consumption, well this is what our great grandparents did around a big box. We're just moving around with it. It's super fun to watch this. I think that blockchain has the potential to take us back to the early villages where it was really based on, you know, you're gonna be trading on your reputation and currency. There's going to be a place that nobody in the middle has to make a VIG between me selling your home because the lease transaction is gonna happen on the blockchain. I mean, it's really fascinating stuff. Financial service companies make a lot of money to be in the middle. That middle is on call. Blockchain to me is even a scarier thing than the internet. You know, I love how everybody's like, our mortgage businesses are getting disrupted by these internet mortgage people, right? And I'm like, wait till you see what the blockchain's gonna do to you. You know, so I, I don't know, but I know this. It's going to be very comfortable for you and I, you and I, when the blockchain is accepted, for you and I to make any transaction and the fact that none of the dollars have to go to anybody else is going to be attractive to you and I. And that is a real technology. And when you think about what financial services do, that really creates a wrinkle to a lot of the margin. Because it's trust. It's just trust. A Couple quick questions for you, rapid fire, because the countdown clock is on. Um, who is the Gary V for Gary V? Like, who's the person that you follow? Nobody. My mom. Is she as active on social media as you are? <laughs> Not as much. Okay. Make sure you call her this evening. I will. Um, what's your theme song? Uh, the Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> Not surprising. Um, most underestimated country that we're not talking about enough? Huh, that's a good question. Uh, that's interesting. A um, couple things, I'll just give you some things that came to mind. I'm super interested in Africa as a whole. Ghana specifically has got my attention. Um, hmm, and that's what I'll stick with. Nothing comes to super mind. What keeps you up at night? The health of my family and myself. Only that. It just doesn't feel controllable. Everything else feels, as you can tell, controllable to me. Where do you not want to waste your time? Um, you know, it's funny. I don't think, and this was a couple other answers, I don't think I, va- you know, it's so funny. I'm a contradiction, enigma a little bit. I so value time and then I don't value time. And I never think about that. I think I make the best choices I can and I let the chips fall where they may. Okay. Um, if you had to do it over, what would you do differently? Um, you know, not much. I mean, you know, I think anybody who's truly happy would be crazy to do anything over again because then some other domino would have hit some other domino. This is why I hate when people struggle with choices. You're not gonna know the alternative. And, you know, and so, you know, I would do everything exactly the same. Good, and then a final piece of advice for the room before you depart. Look, I think the biggest thing I could say is we are so lucky to be living through this time of change. You know, this is a binary thing. You either see this from an optimistic point of view or a pessimistic point of view. I just know, I know it. I watch it in every angle, high, low, left, right, entitlement, coming from nothing. This is the great opportunity. There's such a land grab of opportunity and happiness. It's about getting educated in the details and having a binary point of view of like, either you're on or you're off and and I, I don't want people to be regretful of how special this time was. I understand and I'm very empathetic to lots of the points of views we talked about here, both so- socially, obviously business-wise as well. This is an enormous opportunity um, and I, I really hope you, you look at it through that lens. Give me, give me 30 days of pure optimism and offense and look at all these things. You, you, might be, you might be interested in what you find. Thank you. Thank you.